Thank you, Sean, and thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. Um, I'm always, I always jump at an opportunity to talk about my research. I think it's really cool. Hopefully you guys will have some fun tonight. So like Sean said, tonight's gonna be about ray guns and the ancient Maya. So this is one of my field sites. If, they, if anybody ever tells you geology is boring, this is where we do geology. <laughs> What we're gonna talk about today, I'm gonna to do a background, talk about the chronology of the Maya, so when we're talking about how we divide up time. I'm gonna show you some cool pictures of different sites that were um, at their height during each of these times. And then we're gonna get into sourcing stones, which is really where I come in. Uh, one of the things that I did with my research was I tried to find this person. I tried to find the everyday Maya. Tried to find the person in the house, not the king in the throne room. So I looked at these tools here. This is a matate, the grinding stone, and the mono, which is dragged across the surface to grind up food or pigments or different materials. So I went through and developed some methodology using some new technology to answer questions that we couldn't answer before. Then I'll get into why it even matters. As so many of our questions, okay, that was cool, but why? So I'll get into actually why what I did is important uh, beyond just getting able to, uh, being able to get that degree, right? Some conclusions about where these tools came from, how they were moved, and then where we're going next. Because one of the really exciting things is Dr. Lighty and I, we just got a grant to buy one of these ray guns, and so here at Shadron State, we're gonna get some portable x-ray fluorescence to use this fall. So here we are, we're in Belize. We're in Central America. Belize is a small country nestled between Guatemala, Mexico, and Honduras. It's a jungle, tropical rainforest region. It's also the heartland of the Maya. So what we talk about is we talk about the lowland Maya and the highland Maya. The highland Maya are up mostly in the mountains of Guatemala. Belize does have a small region of mountains, but they're, they're kind of tiny mountains. So we don't consider them part of the highlands, we consider them lowlands. This is where, when you think of the Maya and the big pyramids, it's in the lowlands. That's where Tikal is. The first thing we gotta do is set up our timeline. We divide the Maya up into the archaic, pre-classic period, classic period, and post-classic period. Luckily, most of those names are a little descriptive, right? So the archaic is the oldest, from 11,000 to 1800 BCE, so that's before Common Era. The pre-classic is from 1800 to 250, um, so that goes from the before Common Era to Common Era. Classic period um, to kind of uh, orient is around 300 AD, so there's a slight difference between Common Era and the AD BC situation. So the classic period, that's when Tikal was around, that's when your big, big temples, other than uh, like Chichen Itza on the Yucatan, that's when they were um, being constructed. This one is at La Manai. And then the post-classic period is from uh, 1000 CE to contact. The Maya still exist. They didn't disappear. That's one of the misconceptions that we'll get into today. Um, and when we talk about the post-classic, they didn't just gone. A lot of people like to um, make it sound really interesting because they abandoned their large temples, but really they just shifted to a different way of life. We'll start with the archaic, pretty brief, because people weren't sitting still. During the archaic, there were a few scattered sites in the northern portion of Belize and in the southern portion, but we didn't have any major cities. People weren't staying still, they were hunter-gatherer, they were mostly um, still not sedentary. So we have small tools that were easy to carry around, like arrowheads, spear points. We don't have big tools. We don't have much of um, formal agriculture. We get started during this time. Um, one of my favorite things being from Iowa, we, <laughs> one of the best things that we talk about in Central American archaeology is the origin of corn. I love corn in Iowa, right, and Nebraska. So the origin of corn is still hotly debated, whether it started up in the central basin of Mexico, further south. We don't know when corn became an agricultural product, but we do know that it was um, grown in Belize and it did become a major staple among the Maya. Um, populations at this time, small. You had small groups, you had to be able to feed yourself, you weren't getting enough food to be able to uh, stay in one spot. So we had small groups, 15 to 20, not large cities at this point. 
Moving into the pre-classic, this is when the archaeology, in my opinion, gets to be pretty fun. We start to get complex. People get still. We start to have big cities. I was lucky enough, I got to go to La Manai, Black Manetti, and Cajal Petch and look at their archaeology. I got to look at their tools. At this point, we're building stone structures. We're building houses out of wood, and it's wattle and daub, so it's kind of like um, uh, plaster-faced sticks with a thatched roof. We're starting to get tools that are more complex. We're starting to have agriculture. At this point, manos and matates become common in the archaeological record. So we have from these sites the grinding tools that I'll start building my whole research area on. This is Kahal Pet. This is where we came to from being pretty much um, um, hunter gatherers to sedentary. They got good at making buildings pretty fast. Now, back in the day when the Maya were here, these would all have been faced with lime plaster. They would have been painted bright colors. So it's not this stark white that we see today. They were dynamic buildings. Um, the Maya are famous for their blue. And the Maya blue is this bright, almost the color of his mask, a little bit darker than the statue. <laughs> um, and they used that, they used reds, they used yellows. But all of these would have been um, administrative centers. People, the average person didn't live in these big cities. The kings, the elite, and the administrators did. The people who were in charge of running the cities. They got to live in these bedrooms. That's a bed. Not a very comfy one, but that is a bed back there. Um, one of the neat things about the architecture is it's designed to control where you go. And as you move into the royal rooms at Kahal Petch, the ceiling, the doorways get shorter. And so you had to bow before the king as you were coming in. And that's one of the reasons, uh, if you ever see these pyramids, the steps are very steep. And so you always have to come up them leaning over, showing deference to the, the big guy on top. So they did a lot of purposeful things to keep people where they were supposed to be. Now, beyond here, outside of these, in the rural areas, the hinterlands, that's where everyone else lived. Most people were living in small house groups where you would have four to six small houses around a platform. You lived in family groups. Your small nuclear family would be in one home, and you did a lot of your activities outside as a communal group with your extended family. Your mano and matate are outside because it's hot in the house, right? And it's the jungle. You don't want to be in the stiff house. You want to be out in the breeze. So the people that I'm looking for, they're not here. They're outside. They're using these. This is a beautiful footed matate. They don't all come with feet. Some of them are pretty thick, and they just sit on the ground. There's a lot of variation in the type of matate, but it always comes with a paired mono. They're constructed together. They fit together. If they're mismatched, you're not gonna be able to grind very well. And your mono can be short or long. Some of them would hang off the edges of your matate. Now, you'd put your material here, and you'd have a bowl at one end, and you would grind and grind and grind. The hard part to me is you don't roll. You actively drag the mono across the surface, and when you're done, you put it in the bowl at the bottom. And that's how you grind your corn for your tortillas. You grind your coffee, you grind your chocolate, you grind everything you need with that. These tools are long-lived. They're not something that every single person has. Maybe one or two women in the household group have a mano and a matate, and everyone uses them. They get handed down, and they travel with you. A granite matate can weigh upward up to 50 pounds, so you're not moving it unless you have to. You're keeping that, and you're using it until it breaks. And even then, the broken ones would get used as a mortar and pestle. So you reuse a lot in these situations. So after the pre-classic, we're going to get into our classic era, which again is the fluorescence of the Maya, the height of the Maya civilization. Now you might have uh, the idea of Maya as the peaceful scientist. This was a narrative pushed by early scientists because we didn't have a lot of evidence of war like we did with the Aztecs. The Aztecs were very upfront about how much they liked to battle. The Maya hid it a little bit better. 
but they were just as in to fighting as the Aztecs were. They have um, some murals over in um, Bonampak in Guatemala that show just how uh, vicious some of these battles could be. This is during the time of the Warring States. So as we move through here, you'll see different triangles, different pyramids pop up and disappear. It doesn't mean the community's gone, it means it has less power. So we see shifts in power through time, shifts in who controls what. A lot of these are on or near rivers. Trade moves along riverways. If you have to carry a lot of stuff, they didn't have pack animals. They didn't have horses, no camels, no llamas, no donkeys. So the Maya and the Aztec had to carry everything themselves. So you use rivers. You put things on a boat and you go. We had a lot of fighting up here amongst this group over who was going to control what. Most of the time archaeologists nail this down with ceramics or with lithics. So spearheads, arrowheads are chipped stone tools. One of the things that I wanted to look at was how are stone tools that are ground in, 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 informing us about these changes in power. Who's controlling the manos and the matates? If you guys don't have your basic tool of your kitchen to make your food, if you don't have your coffee pot, how are you going to make it to class, right? If you don't have this absolutely crucial tool, what can you do? You're stuck, you can't make your food. So who's controlling the manos and the matates? Who is controlling the household economy? At this point, we shift to having a lot of major centers. One of the biggest over here is uh, Shanan Tanich. Tanich means stone, so that is stone lady. Um, it's gonna be important down here. There is a little site called Pak Batun. Pak Batun was big in the pre-classic. It was a shell production center. They made shell beads, which were used as currency. They kind of fall in importance in terms of economy here, but they're gonna come back and be very important in terms of matates later. We see huge monumental architecture, La Manai's building large pyramids. We see them over here at Altun Ha, large uh, pyramids at Ushbenka, and Karakal is the biggest site in all of Belize. We see them all flourishing during the classic. This is Karakal. This is the biggest pyramid. Now, um, there's actually a whole other pyramid on top of it. There's two more stories that you can't even get in the photograph here. Once you get to the top of it, you can see you're above the canopy. You're over the trees, and you can see for miles. We have large centers that dominate, and they fought each other all the time. They were constantly vying for who was in charge of what. And again, a lot of times we see this through elite goods, things that the elite would have had control over that were imported from elsewhere. So what impact did these wars have on the local people? We have a lot of the hinterlands. Again, people aren't living in the cities. They're living outside. They're farming outside. They're coming in for market activities in plazas. They're coming in for their religious activities. They're coming in to pay their taxes essentially. There was a, a very complex system of um, what you had to give to the, to the ruler, to the elite, the aha, is how you say it, um, what you had to give him in order to get to stay living there and to be part of the community. All of these households depend heavily on manos and matates, and whenever they break, they don't get rid of them, they use them as fill, and they end up in the middle of a plaza like this one. It's just, there's busted matates all over this site just used for construction afterwards. Now the last time period is the post-classic. And in here, again, Lam and I had a very, very long history. It was one of the few centers that was pretty big throughout all of the Maya history in Belize. We're starting to refocus. This is where you see the decline in the population. The quote-unquote collapse of the Maya starts here. We don't truly collapse. The Maya don't disappear, but it is a period of elonged, um, prolonged drought. There's evidence for some disease, but it's not saying that it's anything that would have wiped out populations. But basically what happened is it became too expensive to have cities. It became really hard to live in a city. 
So if it gets tough to live where you are, what do you do? You move. And people moved. They voted with their feet and they walked away. Nobody's keeping you there. So people left and they went and they became more rural again. There was more of a shift to dispersed populations. They packed up their matates and they went to where they could survive easier. The Mayas still live today and they still flourish in the regions of the lowland and the highlands in Mesoamerica. Uh, we did see increased decentralization until 1521 when the Spanish contacted this region. Um, <clears throat> the Spanish came through at different points in time throughout the Yucatan. Um, the portion up here in Mexico kind of was one of the longer lived. They had a big fluorescence at the end of the post-classic before contact. Um, they did bring in a lot of diseases with them that the indigenous cultures of the New World couldn't quite handle. And so we did have a huge population crash due to introduced diseases. And then this is one of my favorites. This is La Manai. And you can see they have the mask. So these would have been covered in plaster and brightly painted. Those are the eyes, and there's the nose. And again, the ruler hung out on top. They would have had a um, wooden structure at the top of the temple where the, the ruler would have spent his time and had his audiences. There are um, more faces here, but when you actually find these, as an archaeologist, they're tumble. It's more just loose rock that's kind of decaying away into the jungle. So, at this point, again, manos and matates, still the thing. Everybody needs them. They still use them today. The Maya were expert craftspeople. They did a lot with ceramics. They did a lot with shell. They did a lot with bone, with tapestry, with weaving, a lot of other stuff. But I like rocks, and so I focus in on the rocks. This is just some fun examples of what they could do with carving stone. This guy, this is chert, or flint, which is related to uh, the panhandle's favorite rock, agate. This is how they have one, two, three faces carved into here. They did that by chipping it with other stones. This was purely for, for looks. You can't do anything with that. So this was an elite tool this is a stela. You can see a scribe over here, and then he's talking to somebody over here. We've got two people, and then we've got the Maya writing circling the stela itself. This is at the site of Caracal. They had some of the best and biggest stela that you find in all of Belize. The, the stone and mineral workers within the Maya, they worked jade, they worked obsidian. Obsidian is a really good blade. It's sh sharper than surgical steel when it's been napped. They worked chert, like you see here, limestone, like you see here, basalt, when they could get it from the highlands. They worked gypsum, or alabaster. They worked sandstone, and most importantly for me, they worked granite. This is some of the tools that I got to work on. Manos and matates, again, found in every single household. This isn't a matched set, but it does show you the beautiful granite monos and then a partial granite matate. You can even see there's still some scratches and worn surface here from when it was last used. This is the basin shape instead of the table shape with the foot. You can have footed, non-footed, and they come in basin like here, trough and slab. There's lots of variation in what kind of matate you had, and it depends on what you liked. It seems to mostly be a personal preference. Um, they used a wide variety of rocks for these tools. Basalt is scientifically the best. Um, a scientist named Jenny Adams has done a test, a side-by-side -side of grinding corn on different types of rock, and basalt grinds the most efficiently and gives you the least amount of rock per bite, <laughs> which is pretty important, right? Um, granite's right up there, but granite has one major flaw. It polishes. And so over time, you have to have another stone and you have to go in and peck, 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 peck. And you have to re-roughen your surface. Limestone was also used, and this sounds horrible and you can feel it in your teeth, sandstone was also used to grind corn. Oh, imagine eating a sand corn tortilla. But you use what you have to. If your matate is broken and all you have is sandstone, you're gonna have a gritty lunch, right? It's, it, these things are very hard to get. 
This is 50 pounds of matate, and it's from a restricted zone. It's not available everywhere. So they used it for grinding foodstuffs. They would also grind pigment. So one of the, uh, the red dyes that the Maya used was made of cinnabar, which is a mercury-based red mineral. Not great, mercury's not super healthy for you, but it does make a really pretty red. And then it would also be used to grind lime, which they would make their plaster out of that they would then paint. They're still used today, although these are very different manos and matates. They still use them in the household, but I thought this was a really cool other use. So they're old busted matates, they use them for washing. They use them for um, working out the laundry. So this is at a, a local Maya village at one of the sites I was working at, and they would still use their slab matates to really get the stains out. So, back to the map. It's always important to get back to the map. These are some of the sites that I went to during my work. I worked really hard to sample from the north of Belize all the way to the south of Belize. I did pretty okay. I got San Esteban up here in the north, La Manai, La Milpa, and Dos Hombres. Had a whole bunch of sites in the middle, but that's where all the archaeologists are. One of the things about Belize, there's three highways. Three. One goes from the airport across the country. One, the, the airport across the country then goes south through here, and then there's the southern highway through here. That's it. That's the big paved road. So, the archaeology is near the big paved road. So a lot of the sites I went to are going to be clustered around the middle. Now this zone here in the center, that's where we're interested. That's the Maya Mountains, the highlands of the lowlands. These are the zones where I got to go through and collect my rocks in red. And then some of the sites I went to are also still visible. Um, yes, there is a site in Belize called Alabama. Some people from Alabama went and started a banana plantation down there and they were like, yep, we're keeping the name, Alabama. So it's a really neat site. But what we have here is the, we have three distinct granite zones, plutons. Each of them is separated by metamorphic rock. So granite is an igneous rock. It came from magma. Geologists are still working out the relationship between the Coxcomb Basin in the south, the Hummingbird Ridge in the northeast, and Mountain Pine Ridge in the northwest. We know they're related, but we're still trying to figure out, well, why did this happen here? How did this happen? And how are they related? If you want to know more about that, we can talk afterwards. Otherwise, I'll be here until tomorrow. But um, Hummingbird Ridge is right, the highway runs through it. It's great, it's easy to get to. The granite is super accessible. This is jungle with some bare rock. It's pretty, uh, this is the, orange, the citrus belt of Belize. So a lot of the area has been clear cut. Yeah, not great, but it has been clear cut for orchard groves. Down here, this is the hardest one to get to. The Coxcomb Basin in the south is on a jaguar preserve. Pretty wild. Alabama sits right up against it. And on my final field season, I finally made contact with the archaeologist who runs Alabama, and she invited me in. And she made one special trip. She got some of the guys from the village to take me to the granite. I'll show you the pictures. It took a whole day hike, and boy, was I done. But I finally got to find Coxcomb granite on my third field season. And um, pretty excited. I'm the first person to get to date the Pluton directly. So again, I could talk about that later. But up here, got to sample thoroughly all three seasons. Mountain Pine Ridge is an entirely different ecosystem. Mountain Pine Ridge is not tropical rainforest. It's covered with sparse pine and scrubby plants, and I'll show you pictures in a bit. But this one, you can literally walk and pick up small boulders and just take them off and make your monos. Incredibly easy. You don't have no quarrying required. Because that's the other question. Once we get to the granite, once we found our granite, how do we get it out? You have rocks to get your rocks. <coughs> they didn't have metal. There's no metal working here. Um, whenever the Maya did get gold, it came from South America for the most part. So they didn't have their own metal working here. So you literally would make rock stone tools with other stones. So I went through all three um, plutons, gathered a whole bunch of rocks for three years. Really ticked off TSA. 
They were like, what do you have in here, rocks? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't like that joke. Um, but this is what you could find at Mountain Pine Ridge. You could just walk right up. These are all granite boulders. They're falling out. There's a road that's called Granite Cairn Road, which is basically Granite Pile Road. And it's just covered with cobbles that are perfect for taking and making manos and matates. You can go over to Hummingbird Ridge. This is one of the less tropical zones of it. This is actually an active quarry that I stumbled, well not active, but they do quarry here. There wasn't anybody actively doing rock quarry business when I stumbled upon it. But they let me in and they let me collect some granite and this is what it looks like. Here's what we got here. It's pink. You can't tell very well here, but that's geology pink. Here, nice white with some pale blue um, quartz crystals in there. They aren't really blue, but they just look like it. This, um, <clears throat> again, hummingbird, pretty easy to get to. Not too hard, didn't have to work for it. The coxcomb basin. Ju that's my rock. <laughs> In case you can't find it, that's the rock. Um, this is a tumble off of the bigger mountain. Uh, it was incredibly hard. This was the cover everywhere. The last slide that I show you will be the magical waterfall that we found at the end of a very long day of hiking that was actually exposed granite. But the vast majority of what you find here is this. And this is a nice picture of it when you cut it open. That was nice, a nice little tour of the Maya Mountains. Why do we care? Well, because granite is a major, major proportion of what makes manos and matates and beliefs. It's the best rock for constructing manos and matates that you can get in the region. Now, yes, I know, Belize wasn't a thing when the Maya were around. They didn't have that border. They could move beyond into what's now Guatemala, Honduras, or Mexico. But for the sake of our argument, we're gonna stick within that area. The communities nearby had no other igneous rocks. They had no other hard stones. So granite was prized for their monos and matates. So were they getting it from the Maya Mountains? Or somewhere else, Honduras has granite, Guatemala has granite. Were they actually using what's nearby? Just because you can go buy something at Walmart, does that mean you're not gonna buy it on Amazon? We do silly things. We do things that aren't energetically like, straightforward. You might go to Rapid so you can go to Target instead of going to Walmart here. You go out of your way to get things. So we're the Maya of Belize going out of their way to get granite. And then lastly, one of the questions that I, again, I had a couple of really lucky breaks during my dissertation, um, and we got to stumble upon who was making these tools. So I'll get to tell you all about that in a bit. But here's my tool, the portable XRF. X-ray fluorescence is a really neat burgeoning technology in archaeology. It's been around since the 90s, so for a while, but we're really getting to go um, to, to ask cool questions with it in archaeology in the last 10 years. So it's newer technology, and using it within 30 seconds, you can have a complete chemical output from magnesium to uranium on the periodic table. 30 seconds. You don't have to do it, you just literally, it's about the size and heft of a, a drill, a power drill. Put it next to something, touch it, go. 30 seconds, you, you know what's in it. It's wild. Non-destructive, no sample prep. I didn't have to break any artifacts, which was huge. You can use it on soil, rocks, ceramics, glass, obsidian, chert, anything that's solid. It's used extensively in exploration geology today, looking for where there's new stuff to mine, looking for where there's important ores. They use it a lot in museums to figure out uh, what type of pigment was used. You can use it to identify forgeries in paintings. It's wild. Um, it's used a lot in environmental geology to find out if there's lead in something or if there's been um, heavy metals in your soils. And of course, archeology. span So my work, developed a new, they call it a novel technique, um, for sourcing granite without having to destroy it. One of the tricky things is, PXRF has a beam about that big. Some of my granite had individual crystals about that big. So if I'm trying to find a representative sample of my granite, I can't do it with one shot. I had to develop a methodology for figuring out how many randomly selected samples I, or data points I needed to take 
to approximate taking the rock, breaking it up, grinding it into a powder, sending that powder to a lab, and having them do XRF on it. So I did that in order to use that to determine source locations for the tools. So I went out and I found a bunch of rocks in the mountains, destroyed them, used them for my uh, database and for my test, my, my, uh, my test set so I could test my theory and my idea of how this would work. And then I got to work on the archaeological tools once I figured it out. So I had to do an XRF, PXRF side-by-side -side analysis. I ended up also doing petrography, so I cut up my rocks into microscope slides and checked them out underneath a microscope. They're really cool. It looks like crazy art, right? So I got to go through and I had to first prove that these three mountains are actually different. Because that's the first question is, are they actually different? Mountain Pine Ridge stands out. It's got big chunky crystals and not a lot of bright colors. The bright colors are going to be our micas. That's what makes things shiny. Hummingbird and coxcomb are very closely related, and it turns out their ages are really close too. So they're likely going to be kind of a, a very close sibling set in terms of magma pulses. But it turns out, again, Mountain Pine Ridge, very distinct. And we can tell the difference between these two plutons, too, if you're willing to take your tool, cut it up, slice it down into a microscope slide. But nobody wants to do that with their artifacts. You can't get them back. So we go to the lab. This is a lab-based XRF. Not going with you. This is the portable XRF. Again, it's about the size and heft of a power drill. It gets very heavy after a while, but not too better than that. XRF itself is one of the most commonly used techniques in archaeology. We have destroyed a lot of artifacts in order to figure out what's in them. If you're using things like obsidian, you don't have to actually powder it. You can just flake off a little bit. But when you're using a non-homogeneous rock like granite, you have to grind it down. So they're both using energy dispersive spectrometry. spectrometry. In both cases, you shoot an X-ray out, you excite the electrons and the machine reads the light that's produced as those electrons get excited. Again, PXRF, this is a little biased because I'm a super big fan of PXRF. Non-destructive. XRF for granite, you have to powder it. You can't do non-destructive for granite. It's quick with no sample prep. For the XRF, I took my big chunks of rock, I put them into something called a chipmunk, and that grinds them into Pebbles. I took my pebbles and I put them into a different type of chipmunk and that made them even smaller. And then I put them into a ceramic ball mill and turned them into rock flour. I took that rock flour and I put it into tiny little cups and I shipped them off to Illinois. And they ran them for me because there's only a few labs around. So that took me a while. PXRF, I go up and I run it for a minute. You get rapid results. And one of the things that I found through my work is you don't need an external calibration. It's actually really accurate and precise. One of the biggest problems was, is this actually real data? Or is it just giving you kind of like, well, there's more of this than that. But it turns out that it's really good, solid, quantitative data. But the XRF has 40 to 50 years of background. Everyone's comfortable with it. Everybody already had a lab that they used. So there's been a lot of pushback in, the, in uh, academia against PXRF. So my field work started in 2013. Oh, that's, that's a while ago. In 2016, I sampled a whole bunch of outcrops. And every year, I got lucky and some archaeologists let me come by. So one of the things I did, um, whenever somebody invited me to their site, I told them, okay, pull out every rock you want to know what it is and I'll identify them all. They let me come in for free and test all of their rocks for free. A lot of times they fed me, it was awesome. Um, so I was like, whatever you want identified, whatever extra stuff you want zapped, I'll give you the data. It's, that's what it's for. It's one of those fun things you get to do in academia. So I visited, I believe, 12 different sites in my three years. I was only there for a month at a time, so I was busy. Now, once I went to all of my sites and I had all of my outcrop data, I analyzed every piece of granite they had, and then what? 
I've got a giant Excel file filled with every element between magnesium and uranium, and I don't know what to do with it. I had to run a bunch of tests through some uh, through SPSS and statistical software. Yep, SPSS, man. And I had to figure out how I can split them. I needed to get these three plutons to split, or not. Wouldn't have been the worst thing if they hadn't split. They only kind of split in the end. So I had to figure out what elements I could toss immediately. I knew I had to get rid of phosphorus. It's not good, it gets added easily. I knew I had to get rid of these because my unit didn't like them. Silica is the most prominent element in our rocks. So silica is just like outweighs everything, so I had to toss it. Aluminum, manganese, titanium, uranium, and thorium were found in too low of a percentage, so my error bars were too great. I also had to get rid of calcium and iron. If they're using lime plaster, they're introducing calcium. Plus, most of Belize is limestone. So all of their soil is filled with calcium. So I had to toss it. Iron is a common weathering product in tropical soils. So I had to toss it. So that left me with a couple of things left. Strontium, rubidium, and yttrium. And they pretty worked. They pretty well worked. They did pretty OK. Yeah, a problem there. I'm going back. But I've got, I've got a little bit of an area here where I've got some overlap. But using rubidium strontium and strontium yttrium ratios, I could pull them apart. Mountain Pine Ridge was really nice. It did its, it did its job well for me and just split itself over there. Mountain Pine Ridge is very distinct. And like I said, Coxcomb and Hummingbird, they're very similar in their petrography. And they overlap here. So we do have an area where there seems to be some relationship. So then, get back to the lab. This is one of the labs and one of my friends, uh, Lauren, she came down with me. I always went with a, a lab assistant, a partner, to make sure that everything, you know, don't want to go alone. So she helped me with a bunch of my shots. Um, we were in a site called Lamanai. It has amazing tools. Uh, they have a piece of chert, a chert, a chert sword. It was wild. They wouldn't let me take a picture of it. It was amazing. Here's some of their ceramics that they were analyzing. They let me in the lab, and we analyzed all of their granite. Again, I went to 12 different sites and analyzed every piece of granite they had. Some places only had four. Some places didn't have a whole lot. Depends on where you were. Most places had a lot of granite. La Milpa and Dos Hombres are up here in the middle. This is all limestone. Very, very, very far away from any granite. They had four pieces of granite. That's it. Not much. Everybody else had a pretty sizable amount of granite. <clears throat> I used PXRF on every single piece of equipment, or of granite, sorry. And every time I had to take no fewer than five randomly selected data points. Turns out with my statistical tests, it shows up if you use five randomly, st randomly selected data points, average them, you can, you can statistically create the same data point as grinding it up, powdering it, and shipping it off. They are indistinguishable. So I was really happy it was five and not 10. But, because um, for each one you have to hold still for a minute, which sounds easy until the clock starts ticking and the flies start biting you. <laughs> They've got doctor flies down there, which are horse flies, but like on steroids, and they wait. They know the moment you start, you hit that trigger, and they're like, they get you. So I went to all these sites. Some of them were under one permit, so I have them kind of lumped together with Bivar, Brea. Um, so Brea is the Belize River East Archaeology Group. Everyone's got an acronym. This is the Caves Branch. I got to Alabama, Ushbenka, and all of these um, communities here. Again, I took five randomly selected data points, but it's important to note some of these things are dusty. They've been in the ground for hundreds or thousands of years. So it was very important that I not destroy the grinding surface because other talented archeologists can get into the cracks between the grains and they can find evidence of what they were grinding. They can find phytoliths and identify what was being produced. So I couldn't wash any of these, but they didn't care what I did to the backside. So if I needed to, they let me clean off the backside of it if I needed to. Um, I always have a smooth surface because they're ground stone tools. They always have something smooth, so I didn't have to worry too much about those sorts of situations. So in northern Belize, I went through a whole bunch of sites. 
I see La Milpa and Dos Hombres, those are the ones where they only had a couple. And then San Esteban. Everybody's using Mountain Pine Ridge. With the exception of one Matate that came from the Coxcomb Basin that's found at San Esteban. So we have one outlier and the start of a trend. You're gonna get really tired of me talking about Mountain Pine Ridge in about one slide. So, Southern Belize, we'll go to the flip side of the board. Alabama and Ushpenka were my two big sites down there. Ushpenka is close to Mountain Pine Ridge, uses Mountain Pine Ridge. Alabama is straight up in the Coxcomb Basin and they still are the only site that's gonna be dominated by Coxcomb. I even have a couple of pieces down here from Ushpenka that they seem to have gotten from nearby. But Ushpenka went a little further away and grabbed from uh, Mountain Pine Ridge. Central Belize is so big and I have so many sites there that I have to use two graphs. Here's the first half. In Central Belize, at the sites of Akhtun Khan, Baking Pot, and Kahal Petch, Mountain Pine Ridge dominates. That's that really pretty pink granite. Now, we do have some variation here. Akhtun Khan was one of the biggest sites in the pre-classic and they seem to have had a further reach. So the average everyday Maya in Akhtun Khan was able to access resources that the rest of them weren't. They were able to engage with exchange from whoever's producing down in the south. The story changes a little bit when we start looking at La Manai and the Belize River East. They're a little more central Belize. These communities, again, Mountain Pine Ridge. One of the interesting things that came out of this, I'm not a ceramicist but I work with a lot of them. And so when I showed them that La Manai and the Belize River East both have some shared Hummingbird Ridge and um, Coxcomb Basin, their ears perked up because these two communities share a ceramic style. And so one of the things we're working on right now is looking to see um, how the timing works out between when they were getting these granites and when they were making those ceramics to see if maybe this was part of a shared trade network that was probably dominated by La Manai since it's the big site on campus there. Then, my lucky break. This changed absolutely everything. Pack Batoon, stone set on earth. This is home to the only known granite groundstone tool workshop in the New World, South, Central, and North America. The only known one, and I lucked into it just happened to come down the year after they found it and they wanted their granite analyzed. It's just fortune smiled on me. They're getting everything from Mountain Pine Ridge. They have literally thousands of pounds of granite that they are working to make monos. They haven't found the matates. They've only found the monos so far. So they are right north of Mountain Pine Ridge and they're using exclusively Mountain Pine Ridge. They're located right next to the major river that feeds all of the big sites. So most likely what we have going on here is we have our producers who sit close to their granite source. They go and they get their materials, they take it back to home, and they make their tools and ship them out. It doesn't seem to have done a whole lot in terms of making Pac Batuna a cultural center. Like they didn't ha they weren't like the controlling power of the region. That lied up, that laid up here with these sites. So we're still working through how Pac Batoon played a part in all of this, but it's very clear that since we have a workshop here and these tools are found everywhere, that they were producing on a very high scale and they were exporting throughout the region. I haven't gotten to go to Guatemala yet. Not sure how that would work. I don't know if I have any contacts over there. But it'd be really interesting to pop across the border and see what's going on at these sites over here. Because there's a couple of big ones. And to see if their granite's moving that way too. Through this, I got to figure out what PXRF can do and try to put together some exchange routes. I start to put together where the tools are coming from and where they're ending up. The in-between's hard to do, right? We don't know where the people, whether they 
or on canoes, boats, uh, were, they, were they walking this around? You can carry one or two matates at a time. The problem is, for being giant pieces of rock, they break easy. They can shatter pretty quickly. So we don't know how they were moved. We don't know why they were moved. Were people moving, or were there people like um, merchants whose job was to move matates? Were they being moved by these merchants to a city and dispersed there? Or did the merchants just kind of go around and go throughout the countryside? These are the questions we have left. So I know through my outcrop uh, database that I can start to match almost any granite. If it came from Belize, I can match it to Belize. And Mountain Pine Ridge is obviously the primary source. We don't know whether Coxcomb Basin was used by any other communities outside of Alabama. <clears throat> One of my goals is to get down to some of the other sites there like Lubantun and Pusilha. Haven't gotten there yet. They weren't doing active work when I was going down. But to see what their granite's made of, that would be important to see if there's somebody who's making these in the coxcomb. It doesn't seem like the hummingbird's being used for much. It was one of the least representing granites. So why? It's easily accessible, far easier to get to than the coxcomb basin. Why is nobody making a workshop there? Or have we just not found it? So. Again, these are the cool things that I'm hoping to get back down there to do work on. Um, my next trip down, I'll be back in central Belize uh, working on some samples that have been collected in the past few years between like finishing my dissertation and now. And then um, I actually have a really cool opportunity, really cool opportunity. I'll be heading down to Bolivia soon and uh, I'm getting to this site that's carved directly out of the Andes Mountains. It's not granite, but it'll still be fun. Um, this is called Samaipata. And it is a pre-Incan site. And so they want me to come down and do some PXRF work there um, and learn how to fly a drone. That should be a treat. One of the cool things we're going to do here is we're going to start working on it uh, using PXRF around here. We're going to be using it on all the rocks. Um, I'm really excited to hear what fun things you guys have you'd like to have analyzed. So we can use it on meteorites, if you think you got a meteorite. We can use it on museum studies stuff. We can use it for any sorts of research project where you want to figure out the chemical makeup of something solid. So uh, Dr. Light and I are really looking forward to breaking it in this summer and this fall. With that, I have a couple of people from my maps. And there is my promised granite waterfall. Still hidden, but there's my granite waterfall. It took six hours of hiking in 100% humidity, really hot, full gear. I was done. But it was great. It was worth it. So, yeah. any questions? Yeah. What is the good cost, and is it like battery operated? You have to charge it. Yeah. So it is battery operated, and they've got this cool hot swap feature where you can change out the batteries. They look like um, the long camera batteries. You can swap them out in 30 seconds, and the gun won't sh turn off. They run about um, 35 to 45 thousand dollars depending on what kind of uh, uh, accessories you get with it. So, yeah. We got a, a tabletop bench that has a lead-lined roof on it, so we can actually do very safe lead-lined um, analysis in the lab here. It does have a kill switch, so if at any point the gun is not pressed perfectly against something, it won't shoot. It doesn't want to put the x-rays out into the atmosphere, so it does turn off automatically, which turns out to be really obnoxious because if you accidentally wiggle because you got bit by a bug, it will ruin your shot and you have to do it again. So that's why it was important to have two people. I said it was for safety, but it's so one person can fan the bugs away while the other person does the data analysis. These are the silly things you do in the field. So yeah. Is the size of the river different near Hummingbird? Yeah, it, it has one big river, the Saboon. So it has one big river that runs through it to the coast. Um, but it's, it's, I think, in my, um, this is my personal conjecture, I think it's more that there's no big cities. But it does have one big river, and it's closer to the coast. So that's the other thing is like the rivers, there's one big river that runs out of Mountain Pine Ridge straight up to where the major communities are, but you lack the coastal exchange, which we know the Maya were going all the way around the Yucatan. So it's really weird to have it that far inland, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And if you ever do make it to Belize, in that area of the Hummingbird Ridge, it has one of the, um, the coolest sites. It's a cave site, and you have to swim to get there. And it's uh, home to a, uh, the, they call her the Crystal Maiden. She was left there, and she is turned into calcite. So, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Um, if you shot the gun at like a tree, what would happen? Does it analyze it, or does yeah. it have to be? Yeah, it'll come up with some of the rare earths and stuff, some, some of the minor stuff in there that's not just carbon. Pop up with something, and probably some high error bars. <laughs> Might be a little unhappy, but it would definitely, if you had uh, like these, it would. If I came near here, it would definitely get the metal. So, but it's a really neat tool. It's very versatile and can do a whole bunch of different neat things. That's really going to change our capstone, I think. So, yeah. So with the first gun that you took down there, was it paid for like from a grant or? I had the best PhD advisor in the whole entire world, and he bought me one with a grant. Wow. I, right? And then he, yeah, uh, yeah. He, um, he and the archaeology department, because he was in geoscience, and the archaeologist, they um, had a deal where they bought two, the, these two, archae the archaeologist and my advisor, um, they bought, they went together, got a grant so they could uh, do a kind of a, a bundle and get like whatever, 10% off or something silly. But um, they both, they bought those because uh, I wanted to use it. <laughs> I, the best advisor ever. He was so great. And he, he didn't ever use it. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really fun. Uh, that's the one site in Hummingbird that I showed you where it was a quarry. So it was like my second day in Belize. I hadn't adjusted to Belize animals yet. And we drive, we're driving this tiny off-brand car. We come around the corner, my friend Sarah and I, I'm like, why is there a bear? <laughs> and she's like, what do you mean it's a cow? A tapir mama and her baby just come walking out, out of nowhere. And so we obviously stopped the car and we roll down the windows and we're listening. And so we get to see these, this tapir mama and her baby. They made all sorts of cute grunts and everything. And we go back to the hotel that night and <laughs> the people who run it were from the area. And they're like, I've never seen a tapir. I've only, I've only seen one at the zoo. What do you mean you just saw one down there? Where did you see it? <laughs> so it was, yeah, like some really cool magical moments down there. And uh, yeah, a lot of How lot of widespread were the Mayas? Oh, incredibly widespread. So their, their main region of where they were, had their communities was basically the Yucatan all the way across to the Pacific. But the Maya actually lived up in Teotihuacan and Tenochtitlan in Mexico City area. So there were barrios in Mexico City at Tenochtitlan that were inhabited by Maya people. And Aztec came down as well. So we see a flux between the two uh, major the communities. Obviously there were a lot of other uh, cultural groups down there as well, but the Maya were pretty far uh, spread. We do have trade from the Maya to Arizona and New Mexico. They have macaw feathers and quetzal feathers that came up to what is now the United States. So, and then um, they also traded down to South America too. Thank you. Yeah. You said that one of them was on a jaguar preserve? Yeah, I didn't see any jaguars that time. Well, I saw the tail of one at a different time. I was at one site and they were, uh, oddly enough, getting, they were just tearing down from a chocolate fest. I missed it. They had a whole festival based on chocolate, and I was one day late. And I'm behind this pyramid walking around, because I just look for granite in the building fill now, because I'm that person. And I'm back there, and I see this much of the tail, the black tip and the spots, and I hear it walk away. And I turn around, I'm like, where is it going? And my, my friend Sarah was like, no. <laughs> She's like, we don't follow the jaguar. But um, honestly, the scariest animals down there are the spider monkeys. They are mean. They do not like, they are mean. So uh, my Indiana Jones moment, Mike's heard this story. It was our last day of field work. We were on the, as is tradition, the last day at this one uh, site. We were walking the last line. Two of us stayed at one end and the other two walked down, my advisor and a friend. They walked down just to see if there's anything there because if there was nothing there, we weren't going to map it. 
So my friend Tony and I are standing there, we're talking, we're like, we have to go up this hill. It was a big hill. And we were tired. And suddenly we see my advisor and my friend, go, go, go. And they are walking as fast as they can. They are not, lo they are looking straight ahead, walking, and they are, get up the hill, get up the, okay. And then we hear the shrieking. They're being chased away from a small temple by spider monkeys. We had to go back the next day. We, had, we get up the hill, at the top of the hill, and suddenly they are just quiet. And we look up and there are three howler monkeys. And the howler monkeys and the, and the spider monkeys, they fight. And the howler monkeys always win. So we got to howler monkey territory and the spider monkeys disappeared. So we gave the howlers all of our uh, oranges that day. <laughs> and the next day we went back and we had to map that temple because it was a whole temple group and the spider monkeys stayed away and the howlers showed up and they, they made sure we could map. It was very nice. They wanted more oranges. So, but it's a, it's a really neat place. It's such a fun, it's a fun time to do work. So this is what you can do with geology. Yeah. Snakes. Oh, so many snakes. So many snakes. We saw a coral snake. They've got a very aggressive uh, venomous viper. They call it a Tommy Goff. I can't remember what its actual name is, but it will actually come at you. Um, so you had to wear snake guards up to your knee to avoid getting bit by those. And one day at the first camp I was at, we didn't have running water. We had latrines. A big yellow boa constrictor was warming itself on the seat off of the warmth from the latrine. And so one of the guys had to go out with a bucket and get the big boa constrictor off the toilet seat. <laughs> so, and there are tarantulas and scorpions and all the fun stuff. It was, yeah, I saw more wildlife there. But it's still fun. <laughs> the scorpions are the scary ones because you don't see them. They probably haven't met any of the Mayas that are still, still in the area. Yep, and so uh, the, the site of Alabama was one of my favorites because it was located right near Maya Mopan. So it is an, a, a, um, almost a reservation type. It is put aside by the government for the Maya to live on. There are areas that are put aside for Maya communities. Um, and so they get to live in they keep their traditions alive, and uh, they, we got to eat breakfast there with the Maya family every day, and it, we, uh, at the end of the field season, took them all the really cool stuff, like all the little figurines, all the neat pieces of lithic and pottery, and we would tell them about what we learned. And so we would go back every time, and we, we'd do a special one for the kids, and all the kids would come out, and we'd get to hang out and talk to the kids in the community, and then we'd get to talk to the grown-ups and tell them all the stuff and answer their questions about what we're doing up there. So. Yep. So up until the late 70s, it was British Honduras. And so it is uh, English speaking first. They do speak some Spanish. They speak uh, Creole. And they speak, uh, they do have different dialects of Maya that are spoken down there too. So, yeah. It's a really beautiful country. Um, the sites that you were going to, were they predominantly like American universities or was there a lot of coordination with? Canada. Oh, okay. A lot of Canada. So oddly enough, it's a lot of University of Texas system and a lot of Canada. <laughs> so um, there were a few other, like Emory's down there. There's a few, um, goodness, I should know where everyone's from. But Alberta, um, Athabasca, there was uh, Kennesaw from Georgia, but it's run by a guy who's from Canada. Um, so it was very varied, but a lot of, mostly American schools. But that just was because it, I knew from the UT system, that's how I got in was from my master's at, in uh, UT San Antonio. Were there so. very many Central American universities? No. Okay. The, Belize archaeolo the Belize schools there don't actually have degrees in archaeology. Oh. There are two major colleges and like uh, four-year institutions there, and they don't have uh, degrees to go into archaeology. Oh, there was somebody from uh, Oxford. Lam and I has a, one of their lead people is from Oxford. So that was really neat. Thank you.